Good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this ADA Scientific Sessions Corporate Symposium event. My name is Dr. Ian Neeland, and I will be the moderator as well as speaker for tonight's symposium entitled Nutritional Approaches for the Prevention and Remission of Type 2 Diabetes and Weight Management, which is being sponsored by the Nestle Nutrition Institute and supported by an educational grant from Nestle Health Science. This symposium will address the importance and role of nutrition intervention on the pathophysiology and development of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and comorbidities, including metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. Additionally, current and emerging novel non pharmacological approaches to weight management, the prevention and remission of type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular risk reduction will be discussed. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, there will not be a live Q&A session following the presentations. Instead, while the presentations are running, both myself and Dr. Taylor will be live online and available to answer your questions using the chat box function located on the right side of your screen. So if you have questions anytime during either of our presentations, please type them into the chat box and we will try to answer them as quickly and as best as we can. I also want to mention that due to time zone differences, Dr. Taylor will only be available uh, with us for the first hour. Although he indicated that questions can still be submitted and he kindly agreed to answer them offline following the event. Second, the speaker bios and copies of the presentation slides have made available for download under the supplemental files link. Now, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Roy Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a professor of medicine and metabolism at the Newcastle University and Newcastle Hospital's NHS Trust in the UK. He's been conducting research on type 2 diabetes since 1978 and founded the Newcastle Magnetic Residence Center in 2006 to apply innovative techniques to study in all medical specialties. In 2011, he showed that type 2 diabetes was a reversible condition of excess fat within the liver and pancreas. This led to the Diabetes Remission Clinical Trial, or DIRECT, which demonstrated that type 2 diabetes can be reversed to normal in primary care and that the underlying pathophysiological changes were durable. Professor Taylor also developed a system in the UK for screening for diabetic eye disease and the Newcastle Obstetric Medical Service, which helped to advance clinical management of diabetes and hyperemesis. I will now hand the floor over to you, Dr. Taylor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you on this occasion about this very important topic. This is something that anyone who looks after people with type 2 diabetes should understand. And those people who research diabetes really need to be up to date with these recent observations. The matter of achieving effective weight loss and remission of type 2 diabetes is central to the presentation. But in order to achieve this understanding, we've we have used advanced magnetic resonance methods to investigate the in vivo biochemistry of the body. Now, here we are at the Newcastle upon Tyne quayside. This is the River Tyne, and these are our famous bridges over the River Tyne. In the foreground, we have our Millennium Bridge, a splendid structure with reflections and Reflecting is something that's really very important. Let's reflect upon the nature of type 2 diabetes and leading into that, the nature of how we control sugar levels normally. Here are my disclosures. And the remarkable thing is, everybody listening to this lecture has one thing in common. We all woke up alive this morning. How did we do this? The brain needs a constant supply of glucose, uninterrupted, for normal function and continued life. Of course, it obtains this from the blood. But what is maintaining the balance? Because blood glucose levels normally remain approximately constant overnight. And it's no surprise that this is the liver. The liver puts out glucose at a constant rate, which overnight matches this which accounts for almost all the glucose production in normal life. This isn't often thought about, but we should think quantities here. How much glucose did you produce overnight in an hour? And if your metabolism is normal, then it's likely 
that you produced approximately 10 grams of glucose. I measured this out in this glass here. But let's now consider the situation in diabetes. How much glucose did the liver of a person with diabetes produce in the same period of time? And the answer is about 15 grams. Here are the data from these two separate publications. Here is the normal. And you can appreciate from this slide the answer to the question that your patients will sometimes ask you, why is my sugar higher when I wake up than when I went to bed? It's a puzzle. I didn't eat in the night. Well, the answer is the insulin which was struggling to control the evening meal can eventually in some people break through and achieve some lowering of glucose. But overnight, the shots are going to be called by the liver. And that is a process controlled by insulin, of course. Taking this on, if that's one hour, what does six hours of sugar look like? And this is it. No wonder your patients with type 2 diabetes wake up in the morning with a high fasting blood sugar. This physiological knowledge, together with research that I'd been conducting at the time, looking into the, the matter of the insulin sensitivity of the liver to controlling this process and examining whether this was related to the amount of fat in the liver. It was. This work came together with work from others, notably Kit Peterson at Yale, Anna Yikiyarvan in Helsinki and others, and it was possible for the first time in 2006 to explain the whole of type 2 diabetes in a hypothesis. Now, this is armchair philosophy, but this is how it goes. If there's excess fat that's built up in the liver because of a few extra mouthfuls too much of food over many years, this is going to not only cause the raised glucose we've already talked about, but also the liver is responsible for distributing fat for metabolism, for energy throughout the body. That speed of process increases, and so excess fat is supplied to the whole body. And that will silt up in ectopic sites when the subcutaneous stores are relatively replete. And one of those sites is the pancreas. Extrapolating from Roger Unger's classic studies from the 1990s, whereby chronic excess fat suppressed insulin secretion in response to glucose, I suggested that perhaps this is the cause of type 2 diabetes, slow suppression of beta cell function. And so we have one factor, fat, explaining both liver and pancreas problems. Beta cell dysfunction that occurs has since been explained very nicely by the brilliant studies of Mimo Achille from New York, in that excess fat can produce a metabolic stress in the beta cell. This causes loss of the specialized function. Under the metabolic stress, the beta cells go into a survival mode. They de-differentiate, they lose their specialized function. So here we have a very simple explanation for type 2 diabetes. In a way, it should surprise none of us that the explanation is a simple one, because here we have the commonest metabolic disease of man, which happens in all races and happens in many animal species too. So this is the hypothesis, but it led to a prediction. Hypotheses are useless unless you go out and test them. And to test the predictions of the twin cycle hypothesis, we could use our magnetic resonance methodology to check because it postulated that negative calorie balance should decrease the fat level in the liver. That should improve insulin action. It should normalize overnight blood sugar control in people who previously had diabetes. Well, that's a bold statement. But even bolder is in the pancreas. If the fat levels decrease, that should normalize the insulin response to eating. Well, we tested it. 
let me just show you a magnetic resonance image, first of all. This shows in color coded fashion the liver fat content. Here is a code over here. Red pixels in this image are almost 100% fat, all the way through these different colors to black, which is effectively just water. So, of course, inside the aorta, it's largely water. Under the skin, here we have the front of the abdomen and here's the back, it's almost entirely fat. But just look at this large organ here. This is the upper abdomen, and of course, this is the liver. It's this unpleasant blue-gray color, which shows that this person has an average liver fat of 36%. They had unremarkable type 2 diabetes. They were not known to have any defect of the liver. Well, we tested them by putting them on a 800 calorie per day diet, one that was sustainable, and we'll come to later. And these are the results. Eight weeks later, the liver fat was 2%. Well, did it change the glucose control? These data were published in 2011. And here is a seminal graph. Within seven days, fasting plasma glucose was normal in this group of people with type 2 diabetes, even though their metformin tablets had been stopped on day one of the diet. It remained normal for the duration of this acute hypothesis testing experiment. Let me just draw attention to the fact that we recruited people with perfectly ordinary type 2 diabetes, but for this study, I selected people only in the first four years of the disease in order to get a homogenous group. Naturally, that led to the question, how about longer duration type 2 diabetes? Would that respond in the same way? Well, we moved on from the counterpoint study to the next study. But before we did that, we could consider these results. At seven days, 30% fall in liver fat, completely normal liver insulin sensitivity. Metabolic changes and substrate level control can happen rapidly. But in the pancreas, changes are not particularly rapid. And there was a very gradual fall over eight weeks and a very gradual return of first phase insulin response. The hypothesis held up. So what about duration? We next studied a larger group of people with up to 24 years duration of type 2 diabetes. The duration was not limited by the protocol. It just so happens that these were the longest duration people. I'm showing you in the graph the acute insulin response for those people who return to normal control. You can see from an indifferent response at baseline after the weight loss period and the period on normal eating, or two weeks on normal eating, these people had normal, as illustrated by the blue line, normal first phase insulin response. When their weight was kept steady, as indeed it was, for six months, this remained absolutely normal. There is no steady inevitable onward decrease in beta cell function in these people who've lost weight and then keep it off. But these are the responders. How about the non-responders? Well, what a pathetic response. The beta cells just did not wake up. But let me emphasize that the big difference was at baseline. Look at this baseline and compare it with this baseline. These people were very similar to these people at baseline. They look the same, similar age, similar BMI, similar balance of male and female, etc., with one difference, and that is duration of type 2 diabetes. Those people who responded had a mean of under four years duration. The people who didn't had a mean of about 10 years duration. But you and I deal with individuals in our clinic. Look at the range. Some people 
could only bear this excess fat for a year or so before they could no longer cope and recover. Whereas other people were able to deal with this excess fat for a long time. Now, in this study, no one with the duration of diabetes of greater than 11 years responded, but there are only 30 people in the study. In my clinical practice, I know of two people, both of whom have had duration of diabetes 23 years, who've been able to stop their tablets and return to normal function. Individuals vary. Individuals are heterogeneous. But we can deduce from this that there is a property of the beta cells themselves, which is resilience to the excess fat and glucose supply. Those people who are genetically blessed with relatively resilient beta cells are able to withstand many years of type 2 diabetes and still respond. But most people cease to respond after 10 years or so. Now, of course, this took us on further, and we can look at the hypothesis from the point of view of an even larger study. Direct was a randomized control trial we carried out to test the feasibility of the dietary process in primary care. This was administered by primary care nurses, occasionally with dietitians, if the practice had dietitians. But they were given eight hours of structured tuition in how to do it. 46% of people returned to non-diabetic control after 12 months off all tablets for type 2 diabetes. Let me show you the changes in those people who responded and achieved remission. Fasting glucose, liver fat, just look at this. Liver fat was way over 16% in this group of responders. None of these people were known to have any liver problem. But fatty liver is a typical feature of type 2 diabetes. And this returned entirely to within the normal range at five months. I'm just showing you the data for the uh, post-weight loss phase for simplicity. That's a liver fat. Now, liver fat has got a wide range and is labile. Pancreas fat is a different organ, whereas in the liver, all the fat is inside the liver cells. In the pancreas, there's a lot of it in adipocytes between cells. And so it's unsurprising that the background level is relatively high. But nonetheless, we get a highly statistically significant fall back towards that of the normal population. And how about the acute insulin response in this large study in general practice where nurses advised large numbers of people, 149 in the intervention group and similarly in the control group, Nurses advised people on what to do. Well, yes, we can recover the acute insulin response with simple advice. Let me break off at this time to emphasize the importance of the scientists who've contributed to this work, especially Andy Blameyer, professor of MR physics and lecturer and senior lecturer in MR physics, who devised this methodology that allowed us to move forward with our study. Of course, there were clinical research fellows, dietitians, a large research group involved, and I acknowledge all of their inputs. But one value of doing research using effectively MRI is that we can actually look at the shape of organs. And in a completely separate study, Way back in 2015, we discovered that the pancreas in type 2 diabetes was about two-thirds of the volume of that of non-diabetic people of matched body size and matched for all other characteristics. Two-thirds. This has been overlooked in type 2 diabetes. But it opened up an important question. What would happen if we return these people to non-diabetic control? Would the pancreas recover? Or is it that people born with pancreases like this are prone to type 2 diabetes? Well, the results are laid out here for you from the direct study. 
over five months, there was no major change in volume of the pancreas. 12 months, it was decidedly increased, significantly so at 24 months, 12 and 24 months indeed. Not quite yet normal, but the shape of the pancreas is also worth pointing out. These apparent holes in the pancreas are merely parts where the pancreas has involuted because these are surface scans of the pancreas showing the pancreas surface has dipped out of the plane of the rest of the surface. So they're not complete holes through the pancreas, but this moth-eaten pancreas slowly returns towards a normal, relatively smooth shape of the pancreas as we might have imagined it. This gross change in the whole pancreas really emphasizes the nature of remission. It is a return to the normal state. It is not well-controlled type 2 diabetes. Those people have pancreases that look like this, and we know from the UK PDS study and many others that they will slowly, steadily go downhill in the way that used to be assumed that type 2 diabetes always had to go. Well, no. With remission, it is possible to achieve movement very much towards normality. Here I show the whole data. This is the pancreas volume at the top from baseline, five months, no change, 12 months, yes, increasing, 24 months, still significantly different from controls, but the trajectory continues. The shape of the pancreas, measured by an ingenious way that was uh, devised by Ahmad al Muraba, gradually returns to complete normality. Well, that's MRI, but let's return to your patients and mine. What do they want? Well, they want to avoid the unpleasant complications of type 2 diabetes. And we collected data on those in the direct study. This graph shows the serious adverse events. There was concern about low calorie diets. Dietitians and some nutritionalists said, well, that might be dangerous. So we collected the serious adverse events very carefully. What we showed was there were far more serious adverse events in the control group who had best management according to NICE guidelines than in the intervention group who had, in fact, in this study, 12 weeks on a diet of about 830 kilocalories per day. And you can see that it was a far better thing to be in the weight loss group. But what about the major events? How about vascular events? They're important in diabetes. Well, indeed. Let me show you the data for the controls first. Best management according to what you, you and I can do for the best for our patients with conventional means. Well, one fatal MI in the group, two CVAs, atrial fibrillation, aortic aneurysm, toe amputation. Quite unremarkable for a group of 149 people with type 2 diabetes followed over two years. And also five cancers, all of them weight-related cancers. What happened in the weight loss group? One non-fatal MI no cancers pre presenting. Let me hasten to point out that this is nothing to do with the cause of cancer. It's to do with the rate of progression and presentation because insulin is a major factor in promoting tumor growth and in fact inhibiting apoptosis. So there's no mystery about this. Insulin levels decreased by approximately a half in the fasting state following the weight loss no cancers. That has to be good news for your patients and mine. But more than that, there are other benefits of embarking upon this weight loss. Let me show you the data on the blood pressure data. Now, our protocol with regard to antihypertensive agents was sharpened and focused by what we had observed in first the counterpoint and then the counterbalance study. And what we did, in fact, was to stop all antihypertensive drugs on day one of the diet. That took a bit of explaining, 
to get the doctors involved in primary care to accept this protocol. But I showed them the data from the counterbalance study, and they came on board. These are the data from direct. After stopping blood pressure tablets on day naught, day one rather of the diet, after one week, systolic blood pressure was down 10 millimeters of mercury. Stop the tablets, drop the blood pressure. Why? Well, they had started on the low calorie diet. They would have had a profound drop in salt intake, very profound. That almost certainly explains most of this. However, the ongoing fall probably relates more to the reduction in adipose tissue mass and the effects of decreasing weight in general. Here are the systolic data, here are the diastolic data. These data uh, are currently online in Diabetologia and hopefully will be in print very soon. So let's return to the River Tyne and our Millennium Bridge, which tilts along this pivoted axis to allow vessels to go up and down the Tyne. And we can appreciate from this picture, incidentally, just the variety of body shapes. Humans are heterogeneous in body size. And this takes me on to one of the most important concepts that I find is avidly understood and accepted by patients. Look at these three men in the late 40s. Which one or ones do you think had type 2 diabetes? Well, the answer is all of them had type 2 diabetes. Now, those people who view type 2 diabetes as a complex, mysterious disease, or heterogeneous etiologies, would say, well, this person must have a different cause than that person. This is obesity cause, surely. They are not correct. And I hope I can convince you of this. Although this person has obvious excess fat stores, how about this person? Let's just look where these people came from, because all individuals are not homogenous. At the age of 21, this is what these three men look like. This chap played rugby, or if you like, American football. This chap was a cross-country runner. But both of them put on weight into middle life. The susceptibility of people who look like this to the excess fat is in general greater than those people who look like this. But there is still excess fat there. I can tell you that in the current study I'm doing to really get data on a large group of people to ex ex exhibit this phenomenon, the percentage body fat is really remarkably raised in these people who look entirely slim. These people are not slim. They're carrying more fat than metabolically they can cope with. So they have crossed a personal threshold. Let me try and explain this in more detail, especially with respect to what I said about obesity, because type 2 diabetes is often loosely referred to as caused by obesity. Is it? Let me just show you the distribution curve of BMI in a group of people with type 2 diabetes at diagnosis. Now, is this any group of people? Well, in fact, these, this is a representation of the BMI distribution of those people who were recruited to the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study, the famous UK PDS that taught us most of the basics of what we now know of the progression of type 2 diabetes with ordinary treatment. Look at the BMI line cut off of 30. In UK PDS, only 36% of people were obese at the time of diagnosis. What, you might say? That's impossible. Well, no. UK PDS started to recruit in the 1970s when the population distribution of BMI was very different to what it is now. 
if these people were restored to match that population distribution of the background population, it would be the same effect as each of them losing about 15 kilograms. They would go down about three BMI units. So in the next graph, let's just look at the effect of that. You can see the blue distribution has moved to the left. And for the sake of our argument, they have got rid of their type 2 diabetes by this weight loss. Or if you like, this population did not have type 2 diabetes. Now, the 36% who did have obesity, well, that percentage has re reduced to much lower. It looks like about 10, 15%. But is that relevant? These artificial cutoffs are fine for talking about populations, but they have no bearing upon the person sitting in front of you in your consultations. Let's just take three of these individuals and examine their progress. Look at Bill here. Now, Bill was on the right in that picture of the three men I showed you. Bill had a BMI of 38 at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. His 15 kilograms weight loss took him down to just over 34. And at some point in his journey, he crossed a personal threshold, which flicked a switch. Mary, on the other hand, was technically overweight, BMI under 30, but over 25. And she did the same. But Fred was in the normal range, so-called normal range, BMI of 24. He went down to a BMI of about 21. Now, each of these people has achieved a, a change of state. But let's just go and ask a population scientist what has happened. They would tell you with a straight face, nothing has happened because Bill is still obese, Mary is still overweight, and this chap shouldn't have been losing weight anyway. Look at the individuals. This is a nonsense explanation when taken down to the individual level. And I am very keen to draw your attention to the difference, the natural difference, between individuals that you would see walking down the street or indeed coming in and out of your consulting rooms. The differences are important, as also is this concept of the personal fat threshold. You can see that some people may have a threshold just close to where they are. Other people may need to lose the full 15 kilograms to get down below it. But it's a useful handle. Note that the effect is equivalent in all three people. And this man, who now has a BMI of 34, can be left to run along metabolically with a BMI of 34. He is most unlikely to get his diabetes back. We're looking here at a phenomenon of the personal fat threshold, which illustrates beta cell susceptibility. This is a different property of the beta cell from the resilience I referred to before. This is susceptibility. And you can see that this person is very susceptible to moderate levels of fat. This person can carry around large amounts in his subcutaneous tissue and eventually pop up with the diabetes. Can I just take it one step further? and point out that very nice data from the United States shows that if we look at people with a body mass index over 45, we can demonstrate exactly what proportion have type 2 diabetes. The notion that type 2 diabetes is caused by obesity would lead you to imagine that many people with a BMI over 45 must have type 2 diabetes. In fact, 72% of people in this range have non-diabetic blood glucose control. That is really very important to grasp, hammering home this matter that we are personal physicians, we deal with individuals. So let's hear it for the personal fat threshold, a concept which is very gratefully received when your patient has said in the consultation, you will have heard this many times as an 
I have. Why have I got type 2 diabetes? All my friends are fatter than me, and they don't have it. Well, we can explain. It's an unfortunate, unlucky draw in the allocation of genes, but the writing is there on the wall. Anyone with type 2 diabetes needs to lose weight in order to have a chance of achieving remission. Is there any evidence for this wild and wacky concept, this new approach to looking at our patients? Well, yes, here we have the Nurses Health Study, well-known large study of women followed up from early life into later life over several decades. Those who put on a lot of weight and had a BMI of greater than 35 had an enormously higher relative risk. And that's what's usually said when this graph is put up. But it's not where the action is. This is where the action is. Just look at this indecent rise in relative risk. It is, in fact, a fourfold increase in risk of developing type 2 diabetes if BMI goes from less than 23 to 23 to 25. Fourfold. Just reflect upon cardiovascular risk studies. Excitement is generated when relative risk is 1.4-fold, 1.5-fold, 2-fold would be wild. But here we're talking about 4-fold. Small amounts of fat, which cannot be borne by the individual, can cause mayhem. Now, Newcastle-upon-Tyne is called Newcastle-upon-Tyne because it built a new castle, in fact, in 1186. And here it is, still standing. We have a magnificent crown-topped cathedral standing close by. But taking this information out to our patients, out to the wider public, is so important. And now, let me turn to the matter of how we achieved this matter of effective weight loss. Weight loss has been regarded as an enormously difficult matter, and indeed, I wouldn't want to trivialise it. The heavier a person is, in general, the more difficult it may be to bring them back down, because the higher reaches of obesity induce secondary changes, and things get more difficult. But our people with type 2 diabetes have got a wide range of body mass index. In order to test the hypothesis, the very first point I made in this lecture, I had to devise a way of decreasing body mass by about 15 kilograms. That was my back of the envelope calculation. In that study, we achieved 15.3 kilograms weight loss on average. How did we do it in eight weeks? Well, we used an approach which was simple and practical. It was feasible for the individuals to do in everyday life. And having been practicing medicine for 45 years, one gets a feel for what people can do and what is more difficult to do. All of that was rolled together with the physiological knowledge. Now, simple, practical diet, but there's one point that is often overlooked in the diet. I'm sure that. Most people listening to this lecture have referred a person to the dietitian. Please don't do that. People eat in families. Please refer the family, or at least the important leaders of the family, to a consultation with the dietitian. Because having the spouse and partner on board with any change of eating pattern is critical. In the very first study of this series, the counterpoint study, I realized that the weight loss was not just happening to the individual. Often people would bring up with them for our rather long and complicated studies, their nearest and dearest. And they would often be sitting there in the consultation, smiling broadly. And eventually they say, doctor, I've lost weight too. And the fact of that interaction became very clear, but also clear was 
what seems to be an immutable rule. If the spouse is behind the person, then there is a reasonable chance that the weight loss will be achieved. But if the spouse does not wish weight loss or further weight loss, 100%, it will not happen. That is quite a remarkable thing that needs to be factored in, and it has to be considered in each individual case. A further reason for success is that we're looking for dietary restriction over a, fe <clears throat> excuse me, a feasible period of time, eight weeks usually. And this makes it possible to plan, to plan to do this in between other major events. The planning is really important. But please, no additional exercise during the weight loss period. Let me be very precise about this. We're talking about the period of weight loss, this short defined period that has to be entirely nutritionally achieved. If people start an exercise program, a new factor kicks in, probably the best kept secret of the obesity field. Compensatory eating is real. Those people who are prone to put on weight, when they start an exercise program, will usually find at best the weight does not fall, and at worst it rises. It is counterproductive. So we need to be absolutely goal-directed here. The weight loss period is dietary weight loss. That will be successful if the person is sufficiently motivated. But after that period, when we move on to the next phase, that is when increased daily physical activity would be extremely helpful. This is the diet we used in our first study, the counterpoint study. We used a liquid formula diet for breakfast, for lunch, and excitingly, for dinner made up here in a pint of water. Now, I have to point out this is Optifast, which is a Nestle product. For the counterpoint study, I requested that this was donated to the study because it was a study run on a shoestring. Nestle did that, but had no input into design, analysis, or any other feature. And they were very good in not demanding any return for this. This is, in fact, the first time I've lectured uh, on behalf of Nestle Health. But man doesn't live by metabolism alone. We've got to keep the bowels happy. And constipation would be a problem of following this liquid formula diet alone. So here we have a plate of non-starchy vegetables. The type of vegetables can be entirely determined individually. Our research participants came up with imaginative ways of preparing vegetables, soups of various kinds with spices, which of course are allowed, and flavorings. There are all sorts of possibilities here. But this is only step one. This is eight weeks. And then we need to have a very carefully specified reintroduction. Although this was much easier than people expected, the change back to eating solid food was actually a challenge. People went back into the kitchen and found themselves all at sea. They were panicked. What to eat? How much to cook? They had forgotten. Now, that, of course, is wonderful because they have a blank slate upon which to write new dietary habits. So the management in this phase is very specific and directed. Eat this much of this. It can be done. Step food reintroduction over a few weeks. Then there's a long-term challenge of keeping weight down. And, of course, we have no answer to the ongoing exigences of life. Although a few people in our follow-up studies have steadily gained weight, that's not the commonest pattern. The commonest pattern is to be doing fine and then weight rises relatively rapidly when a life event happens. The roof's leaking, there's financial problems, there's illness in the family, all the real life scenarios that hit people. And so, we have to recognize that if weight goes up, it's not a failure, 
but obviously we have to get it down again. And to make the point that weight management is critical, let me just show you the weight trajectories for various people in the direct study. Those people who had no remission, 62 of them, really were characterized by relatively poor weight loss, 5.8 kilograms, way under what is required, and 5.6 at the two-year mark, 24 months. Those people who achieved remission at 12 months, but then life got to them and their weight went back up, well, they were not in remission at 24 months. They've got a really accelerated tick phenomenon. But the larger group, much larger group, of people who achieved remission and remained in remission, remember 46% of the whole group at 15 months, it was actually 36% at two years, they were above their personal, they were below their personal fat thresholds. They had managed to keep off sufficient weight to remain in the non-diabetic realm. Now, weight is critical. The nature of the diet is an individual preference. And I have to say, there is no major advantage for any one pattern of eating compared with another to keep the weight down. The only critical thing is that it is successful in achieving its weight goal. Let me just exemplify this even further by showing you some data from the famous Luca Head study. This focused upon fitness training together with some weight reduction to minimize the risk of cardiovascular disease. And I'd like to show you the multivariate analysis to, show, to identify the major factors underlying remission. Now, remission of type 2 diabetes was not a, an initial goal of Luca Head, but in fact, 11.5% of people following this big lifestyle change were in remission at one year. Let me just show you the factors. First of all, weight loss. Did that make a difference? Well, these are odds ratios of remission. Compared with the people in the lowest tertile of weight loss, those in the highest tertile had over a 12-fold increased chance of being in remission. What about the exercise bit? Because some people exercised really intensively. Well, here we've got the increased fitness data. There was a significant increase in odds ratio of remission. Ha! It was a low increase. And what matters for our patients is the effect size. P-values don't induce health. The effect size of an intervention does. And we can see the primacy of shedding fat from the body compared with the undoubted benefits of increasing fitness. It is really an unequal battle. In order to help with this battle in the direct study, we evaluated the use of rescue plans. We went from the total diet replacement liquid formula to food reintroduction to weight loss maintenance. But in this phase, we used rescue plans. If people regained two kilograms, we went back to use, replacing one day per week, one, one meal per day with liquid diet. If they regained more than four kilograms, if they were agreeable, TDR was offered. And overall, there was no difference in outcomes between those who required rescue plans and those who went through without requiring rescue plans. It's an important factor in the long-term management of weight. Weight regain is not a failure. It's not a disaster. It just calls for focused attention to when people can re-engage with dietary restriction, when the acute event has passed, then just do it. So what are the essential components of type 2 diabetes into the future? Well, at diagnosis, people can be offered a choice. Either they can have conventional tablets and or injections, and we can supervise their increasing gun health over a number of years, or there is a possibility 
of achieving weight loss and remission of the diabetes state with the prospect of long-term health. Personal planning with family and friends is a vital step. The target is very clear. And long-term support is really vital into the distance. Let me show you what our psychological work showed. This was carried out independently, but in parallel with uh, direct. I found it very easy. I started to see weight loss fairly quickly, and that's encouragement in itself. The average weight loss in the first week in CounterPoint is 3.5 kilograms. In other words, about 10 pounds. That is huge encouragement. That's average weight. It was fairly hard to start with. This easy word, I don't particularly like. It's simple, but I would never describe it as easy to people. Fairly hard, but it got easier. I could work further, stand up, sit down, dig the garden. I feel great. The reported increase in well-being was palpable. People benefit enormously. And the commonest comment is, I feel 10 years younger. These are not highly selected comments. But the important factors stood out clearly. Initial determination to get rid of diabetes and the family support. What sources can we offer? Well, the details are all contained now in a book on the nature of type 2 diabetes and how to reverse it. All profits to Diabetes UK, which is a charity that provided the funding for the research. But free of charge on our website is the basic information required to be able to carry this out. But let me finish by showing you a case, because we all deal with individual cases. And let me tell you about Carlos, who has agreed not only to have his case presented, but to be named and his picture shown. He is a US citizen who developed type 2 diabetes in 2008. Three years later, he'd been on insulin for quite a long time by then, he had an acute myocardial infarction. He had a non-healing foot ulcer. And his fasting blood glucose on admission was 486 milligram percent. Not a good situation. He was reviewed by a vascular surgeon during his admission who said that his foot was in terrible shape and he could expect amputation probably in a few months. He went home and was really feeling his life was over. He couldn't sleep. So he trawled the net. He found the results of the counterpoint study. This is 2011. And he said, I want some of that. He lost weight profoundly. His blood glucose returned to normal. Of course, he stopped his insulin. Now, over the years, he maintained his weight, and that was fine. But the acute event, circumstances meant that he had to take a, a job as a long-distance trucker. He ate at the trucker's stops, greasy food, no choice, difficult to maintain his weight shot back up, as indeed his blood glucose did. And that persisted for a few months. He saw the light, gave up that job, and went to a local delivery job. Got his weight down, but not terribly well. And glucose was okay, but not terribly good. And then he saw the light more recently brought his weight back down to a reasonable level. He sends me pictures of his blood glucose meter, fasting 75 milligram per deciliter. Now, if doctors, specialists had seen this person at this point with this fasting blood glucose, they would have been tempted to say, it's a failure. I'm sorry, you need to go on to insulin. Wrong treatment. And with the knowledge of this case, I hope that you will be able to give appropriate advice. And that takes us all the way back to the Newcastle Quayside in the evening, again with reflections. And I hope your reflections match mine. That the etiology of type 2 diabetes is in fact simple. It is a homogenous condition happening to heterogeneous people. There is more fat inside the liver and pancreas than can be tolerated by the individual. Weight loss to below a personal fat threshold is likely to achieve non-diabetic HbA1c 
that is sustainable in the long term. But the duration of diabetes determines the chance of that happening. And achieving about 33 pounds uh, weight loss is actually far easier than most doctors and most dietitians expect using an effective method. There are real lessons for everyday clinical practice in this series of observations over the last 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the great presentation and for sharing your expertise and experience with very low calorie diets and diabetes remission. We are going to shift gears a little and focus on the role of visceral fat in the pathogenesis of comorbidities and cardiovascular risk. Also, I will discuss some of the current and emerging non-pharmacological interventions for the management of weight and comorbidities and prevention of diabetes. Before I begin, just a little bit about me. I am the director of the University Hospitals Center for Cardiovascular Prevention and co-director for the Center for Integrated and Novel Approaches in Vascular Metabolic Disease, or CINEMA, at the University Hospitals at Cleveland Medical Center and a faculty member at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, all in Cleveland, Ohio. Let's transition now to discuss visceral fat and its role in the pathogenesis of obesity and comorbidities. These are my disclosures. Let's start with a case, and a typical case for patients that we see on a daily basis. I recently saw a 43-year-old gentleman who's an insurance consultant. His BMI was mildly overweight at 26 kilograms per meter squared, and he had relatively average uh, lipid profile with an LDL cholesterol of 116 milligrams per deciliter. His blood pressure was 135 over 85 millimeters of mercury, and he was of South Asian ancestry. He then underwent a specialized body fat imaging by MRI and advanced lipid analysis to really better understand his cardiovascular risk. And what we found was that his visceral adipose tissue was extremely elevated at the 95th percentile for his age and BMI. Additionally, his liver fat fraction was 25%, close to four times that of the upper normal reference range. He also had an increased concentration of small, dense LDL particles, elevated triglycerides, an elevated ApoB100 uh, lipoprotein concentration, as well as hemoglobin A1C in the pre-diabetes range. So what we found was that despite the fact that he had only mildly elevated BMI of 26, he really was obese on the inside. And this pretended an elevated cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes disease risk for this patient. It's in this context I'd like to talk about obesity tonight and its extreme impact on the U.S. and global health and uh, the health burden. Now, obesity in 2021 still remains a problem, although many people uh, continue to overlook it as such. And we know that obesity continues to be on the rise in the United States, both among adults and youth. Adults now have almost a 40% prevalence of obesity, and almost one in five youths are obese. And this has increased substantially from just two decades ago. The reason this makes a, a, a important difference in, in our practice for patients is that obesity is tightly associated with the cardiovascular disease risk. And so these representative data from Kahn and colleagues out of Northwestern recently showed in 10 large U.S. population cohorts, including individual level data from adults 20 to 79 years of age, with over 3 million person years of follow-up, that as the obesity degree increases from underweight up to morbidly obese, both for men and for women, the lifetime incidence of cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality increases substantially. We also know that obesity is strongly related to adverse outcomes in COVID-19. These data from the Get With the Guidelines Registry from the American Heart Association in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 showed that in an increasing fashion across classes of obesity, patients were at higher risk for death, mechanical ventilation, venous thromboembolism, and renal replacement therapy as obesity worsened. And these are in-hospital outcomes, but certainly even out of the hospital, there are long-lasting effects as we know now from obesity related to COVID-19. The question though is, is whether BMI alone sufficient to predict and manage risk? 
the reason this is a question is that we know that BMI health outcomes are a heterogeneous relationship. Many patients with obesity never develop cardiovascular disease or metabolic disease such as type 2 diabetes, whereas others who are not obese will. Second of all, the BMI is not a component of the pooled cohort equations or Framingham risk scores for cardiovascular disease risk. And this is most likely due to the fact that it does not in, um, contribute additional information beyond the shared risk factors of BMI. A third reason why it's important to examine whether BMI is sufficient to predict and manage risk is the concept of an obesity paradox. What this is, is that in patients with overweight or mild obesity and established cardiovascular disease, it turns out that BMI is associated with better short-term CVD outcomes compared with normal weight. So those with mild obesity actually are at less risk for adverse outcomes for CVD, heart failure, and other uh, prevalent cardiovascular diseases compared with those of normal weight. And clearly, this is a paradox from what we would normally understand. Now, there are many potential explanations for this. They include the concept of lead time bias, where patients with obesity tend to be younger and also present earlier to the doctor, so they get earlier diagnosis and treatment, which then affects long-term outcomes. Uh, and falsely show potentially that their outcomes are better to, to, due to the obesity, but only because they got treated earlier. Another potential explanation includes sarcopenia, which is low BMI or low body fat percentage, which becomes a situation where one has less reserve to avoid cardiac cachexia and increased catabolic processes when someone is, uh, has prevalent disease. And so those people with better metabolic reserves may do do better as long as they have mild, mild uh, obesity. But I think potentially one of the most important reasons for the LBC paradox is the concept of obesity heterogeneity. What that means is that if you take a wide population distribution of people with obesity, there's significant variation in cardiorespiratory fitness, right? There are some people who are what's called fit and fat, who are able to exercise and to um, attain a cardiorespiratory fitness level uh, as a normal person with normal weight would. Um, but even more importantly, what's underlying this potentially is variation in visceral and ectopic fat burden. And that's the, what I'm going to talk about uh, at great length tonight about this concept of visceral and ectopic fat. It's variation in heterogeneity and how it might underlie much of this uh, variation in obesity-related risk that we see. So it turns out that obesity heterogeneity may be indeed the key to understand why BMI has differential outcomes with adverse uh, health diseases. So to illustrate this further, let me uh, paint a picture for you. If you have an obese population sample, so many of these individuals will develop diabetes, others will develop heart disease over time, but in fact, a significant proportion, up to about a third in many uh, epidemiologic studies, will show that many individuals with obesity will not develop cardiometabolic disease. What underlies this potentially is the concept of dysfunctional adiposity. To understand this, take, for example, a Venn diagram here of patients with cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, such as diabetes, and obesity. And although many people will have one, but not the other, there are a significant amount of people who intersect between all three conditions. And it's this intersection is what we call dysfunctional adiposity. To characterize this, we define it as a pathologic response by adipose tissue to positive caloric balance in susceptible individuals that either directly or indirectly contributes to cardiovascular and metabolic disease. The dysfunctional adiposity is characterized by four main things. First of all, excess visceral and ectopic fat deposition, which I will explain in a minute. Second, we know that inflammatory and adip adipokine dysregulation um, is present when adipose tissue becomes dysfunctional. Insulin resistance is also a key driver for adverse outcomes in this state. And an atherogenic dyslipidemia, much like the profile that the patient in the case that I presented earlier has, also plays a predominant role. Now, visceral ectopic fat are very important to understand. So to illustrate this, take, for example, the two patients you have here on the left uh, of the image. Both patients have identical BMI and identical waist circumference. And in fact, both of them are in the overweight range with a BMI of 27. However, by doing an MRI, they can actually differentiate between visceral fat 
That's the pink fat that's uh, in and around the intra-abdominal organs. And subcutaneous fat, that's the blue color that's in the subcutaneous tissue. You can see that the two patients are vastly different with regard to visceral fat. In fact, there's a close to fourfold difference between the visceral fat in the patient on the right compared to the visceral fat in the patient on the left. And what this determines potentially is increased risk for adverse outcomes long-term related to his overweight and obesity. So we know that ex excess visceral fat is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease independent of BMI and waist circumference. Ectopic fat, which is a cousin of visceral fat, is accumulation of fat in normally lean tissues, such as the heart, liver, kidney, pancreas, and skeletal muscle. Now, importantly, we know that lifestyle, pharmacologic, and surgical treatments for weight loss have an impact on visceral and ectopic fat. And in fact, many of them may have a greater impact on the visceral and ectopic fat relative to body weight loss making visceral ectopic fat a very attractive, modifiable target to track weight loss outcomes. Now, what is ectopic fat accumulation and how does it happen? So first, it starts with an imbalance between caloric intake and energy expenditure, which leads to a positive energy balance. And increased triglycerides that become deposited in uh, tissues, uh, in adipose tissue, but unfortunately adipose tissue becomes inflamed and is unable to expand. And there's a spillover of excess lipids into tissues that normally do not contain them, such as the liver, pancreas, heart, and skeletal muscle. So it's really this imbalance between loading and export of lipids that results in ectopic fat accumulation in organs where they do not belong. And that's what creates disease states of disease, such as inflammation and insulin resistance, and leads potentially to cardiometabolic adverse outcomes. Now, to talk about this and illustrate this further, let me show you some data from epidemiology that we've worked on uh, over the years showing the difference between visceral and non-visceral fat with regard to adverse cardiometabolic outcomes. For example, in this study uh, that we performed in the Dallas Heart Study, which is a multi-ethnic cohort of Dallas County residents, we saw that patients stratified by increasing levels of visceral fat here in tertiles showed an increased incidence of diabetes over time that was not present with increasing tertiles of subcutaneous fat, suggesting that it does matter where the fat is deposited with regard to its association with increased risk for uh, type 2 diabetes over time. And in fact, when we modeled what risk factors were most strongly predictive of diabetes in this cohort, it turns out the visceral fat mass was one of the strongest, most predictive uh, variables, and it was actually outperformed fasting glucose, weight gain, systolic blood pressure, and family history of diabetes. So clearly, in this obese cohort of the Dallas Heart Study, visceral fat mass accumulation was a strong predictor of future diabetes. Applying the same paradigm to patients without cardiovascular disease to determine whether or not visceral fat was really related to increasing incidence for CVD, we did a similar study in the Dallas Heart Study, and again, we see that increasing quartiles of visceral adipose tissue was related to an increasing incidence of CVD, such that people in the top quartile of visceral adipose tissue had a, an approximately uh, two-fold increased risk for cardiovascular disease over approximately eight to nine years. When we modeled this, it turns out that it, indeed visceral fat in an adjusted model retained its significance uh, in relationship to incident CVD, Interestingly, abdominal subcutaneous fat and liver fat were not associated with CVD in this cohort. And also very interestingly, lower body subcutaneous fat, that's fat that's stored in the hips and buttocks, was actually protective of CVD in this epidemiological study. So I think this illustrates very nicely how depending upon where the fat is deposited and stored in the body can have differential associations with adverse outcomes such as CVD. Now let's shift gears a little bit to talk about metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. We all have heard about NAFLD or NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and the prevalence is increasing in the population, concomitant with the prevalence of, uh, increased prevalence of obesity. However, MAFLD or metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver, fatty liver disease is the hepatic steatosis, so that's NAFLD, plus at least one of the following. Uh, cardiometabolic conditions, such as overweight or obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, 
or at least two metabolic abnormalities, such as those that are in the metabolic syndrome criteria. Now, we know that the prevalence of MAFLD actually in, is, is higher than the prevalence of NAFLD in the population, uh, as you can see here, uh, across different age groups. And also we know that MAFLD increases the risk for subsequent cardiovascular disease and cardiometabolic disease beyond those who do not have MAFLD. Now, whether or not the risk related to MAFLD is all via its shared risk factors and underlying cardiometabolic comorbidities, or whether there's indeed an independent contribution to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes risk because of the MAFLD itself in the liver is not quite clear, and further study is certainly needed. But there are many potential hypotheses as to why MAFLD may be associated with cardiovascular disease risk. And they vary from endothelial dysfunction to altered lip lipid metabolism, systemic inflammation, and more. And there's a lot of research that's going into MAFLD to try to determine why is it that MAFLD and NAFLD relate to cardiovascular disease and diabetes risk, and can resolution or improvement in the fat storage alone in the liver help to resolve diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And as Dr. Taylor has, has already shown, um, the liver plays a very keen role in type 2 diabetes, and removal of fat from the liver can actually normalize uh, glucose tolerance in many cases. Now, how do we assess and understand body fat distribution? How do we actually assess visceral and ectopic fat? There are many different uh, imaging modalities that can be used, but probably the two most important include computer tomography or CT and mag magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. These modalities are, provide a cross-sectional imaging, which you can actually directly uh, interrogate and measure the visceral ectopic fat in multiple body fat compartments. Other modalities such as DEXA or ultrasound are less specific and less sensitive for uh, visceral ectopic fat. This is one example of an MRI done to differentiate between visceral uh, and other fat depots, as well as muscle uh, volumes in the thighs. And as you can see, for example, this report shows where an individual's visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, and liver fat uh, burden are in regard to a normal healthy population. And so, you know, many times things, these, these type of reports, which are now currently just available for research, in the future may be available clinically to try to under, help uh, people understand in a, in a better fashion what their body fat distribution burden is as a way to motivate change in behavior and potentially to modify, uh, use modifiable targets to track weight loss interventions. And so although not currently available now, in the future, we should look out for these type of reports because they, uh, they will be coming down the pipeline soon. Now let's shift gears a little bit towards interventions for visceral obesity. And there are many interventions for obesity and visceral obesity, and they run the gamut from non-pharmacological means to pharmacological means and surgical ways. And again, the, depending upon what you pick in terms of your treatment modality might depend on the treatment intensity needed the presence or absence of current disease, and whether or not the previous modality worked, and you're moving on to the next modality to kind of add on to non-pharmacological means, for example, for pharmacological and even surgical modalities. But for today's presentation, we're just going to focus predominantly on non-pharmacological means for interventions for visceral obesity. Okay, so let's talk about that. Now, obviously, the key fundamental uh, treatment for weight loss stems from lifestyle interventions. And lifestyle interventions are always recommended in all situations, uh, as long as they can be tolerated well as the foundation for weight loss uh, itself. Now, this is, applies for generalized weight loss as well as for visceral and topic fat. And the three primary modalities we use for lifestyle interventions include diet, exercise or physical activity modification, and behavioral change. And today, I'll just focus predominantly on diet. So we know that lifestyle modification reduces visceral and ectopic fat. We know this from several studies, but this is just one uh, illustrative study from Gettner and colleagues out of Israel, where they performed a very interesting uh, in-office lifestyle intervention uh, among employees. They included 278 uh, patients with uh, obesity and dyslipidemia, and they applied a multimodality lifestyle intervention that included either increased physical activity or not, and either a low-fat or Mediterranean slash low-carb diet. 
And what they found was that after 18 months in this randomized intervention, both the dietary modification plus minus the physical activity improved weight and waist circumference change in most individuals. However, the degree of change in weight was about 5%, which is what you would expect actually from uh, many lifestyle and some pharmacological intervention trials. But when they actually did pre and post imaging of visceral and ectopic fat depots, such as the, abdom the abdomen, the liver, the heart, the pancreas, um, and the kidney, they actually found that the degree of fat decrease over, this, over time with this lifestyle intervention alone was relatively much greater in many cases than seen with the relative change in weight itself. So for example, liver fat went from 28% down to 5% uh, mean liver fat, which is a much greater fold uh, decrease than one would have expected when just monitoring weight and weight circumference change alone. And this was seen for several other fat depots as well. So um, as I mentioned earlier, imaging the actual fat depots may provide much more information than just monitoring weight change or weight circumference uh, change alone in, in lifestyle intervention trials. And certainly, we should give uh, patients and providers um, a, 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 um, an idea that when monitoring weight loss interventions, even if a patient may not be losing generalized body weight to the degree that one expected, Keep in mind that the visceral and topic fat actually may be modified significantly, which does have long-term health outcomes benefit. So let's talk about diet some more. As you know, there are myriad diets out there, and with social media, now everybody's reporting different diets. And there are several books you can, you can read um, to your heart's content. So it creates a lot of confusion, I think, out there um, in terms of what is the best diet. And it's probably one of the number one questions I get as a clinician in terms of what, what diet should we, should we be on. And probably the most um, asked about diet is the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet goes back uh, many years and essentially is a restricted carbohydrate, high fat intake diet, where the goal is 90% long or medium chain triglycerides in a four to one lipid to non-lipid ratio. That's the classic ketogenic diet. Now the diet does not limit saturated fats. It's the mainstay of many diets that you've heard of called the Atkins diet or South Beach diets. And it's reportedly produces greater reduction in hemoglobin A1C and weight compared with the low fat diet. It's also been used to treat epilepsy syndromes. So what is the data for the ketogenic diet? Well, there's a lot of data out there, but this is one uh, representative study from 2018 showing that a ketogenic diet compared with usual care actually was able to decrease many cardiometabolic risk factors um, in the clinical population, whether it be weight or lipid changes or changes in uh, glucose tolerance. The ketogenic diet certainly does improve many of the metrics that we look at in a cardiometabolic clinic. And compared to usual care, it certainly makes a difference. The question though remains, whether or not it's the low carbs creating the difference, or is it just a proxy for low calories? So for example, in this study out of JAMA um, several years ago, it looked at the contents of a low carb diet versus a higher carb diet. And indeed, it turns out that besides being lower in carbs, the lower carb diet is actually lower in calories on the average about 500 kilocalories difference. So when they modeled this, it found, they turned out that weight loss in these, these trials were associated with longer diet duration and restriction of caloric intake, but were not actually related to the reduced carbohydrate content of the diet. So again, it could be that the ketogenic diet, while it works and does decrease cardiometabolic risk factors that we, that we tend to measure, it could be that that's just a proxy for caloric restriction rather than carbohydrate restriction alone. But certainly, if one is able to achieve caloric restriction via the diet and without any adverse consequences, you know, the diet can be used to uh, create a situation for weight loss. So it is, it is certainly useful. Just keep in mind, it might not be the carbs. It might just be the cows. So beyond ketogenic or other uh, types of pattern diets that we see, there are other options out there in the market for things like meal replacements. Our meal replacements are typically formulated as prepackaged shakes or bars, and they're usually commercially um, made. Now, they promote weight loss by several me methods. One, they eliminate choices because you're uh, either always uh, have to use this meal replacement or partial meal replacement. 
they control portions because they're specific sizes and amounts, and they provide satiation at lower caloric intake because they're designed by nature to have lower calories in each portion. And I, as I mentioned, there are total meal replacements where all the food intake or all the caloric intake you have is through the meal replacement versus partial meal replacements where you mix and match some with meal replacements and some with actual food. Now, the total meal replacements are usually consist of very low calorie diets, which is why they're effective. But the problem is there's a high rates of weight gain after cessation of these total meal replacements as, as expected because your caloric intake jumps up because one is not able to maintain the low caloric the calorie intake that the meal replacements offer by just sticking to them. A couple of examples of these are the OptiFast program, which is a total meal replacement program. In this study from 2018 by Ard and colleagues, and 273 uh, obese individuals after 26 weeks follow-up on the OptiFast diet or total meal replacement versus a standard food-based dietary plan, it turns out that indeed those on total meal replacement had almost a two-fold decrease in weight, um, both at 26 weeks and 52, uh, 24 weeks and, and 52 weeks. And also the greater number, proportion of patients who were on the OptiFast plan versus the st uh, standard dietary plan lost greater proportions of weight, be it 5, 10, or 15%. So uh, indeed it works. A similar idea is Octavia which is a partial meal replacement strategy that combines pre-purchased meals, these are the replacements, with coaches who uh, help patients uh, navigate through the weight loss journey. And predominantly, it comes in five prepackaged fuelings in a day with one low-carb, lean, and green meal. And when tested against the Metafast diet and, and, and standard placebo-based uh, food diet, turns out that Octavia does increase weight loss um, both the percentage and proportion lost. And it, when you add the coaching calls to that, the, you get more weight loss because again, you, you increase adherence to this to the meal replacement plan. Now, as with any uh, food-based diet, just and just like that, that meal replacements do tend to uh, you know depend upon a patient's intake. So a patient can't overeat on meal replacements. And if they don't stick to the, the dietary plan, then clearly their, their, their caloric intake goes up and the meal replacement is not as effective. So, the, you know, with all these possibilities out there, we have ketogenic diet, uh, meal replacements, total or partial, you know, what, what are the guideline-based recommendations from cardiology societies or others for uh, purchase to weight loss? So the most recent 2013 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, Obesity Society guideline for the management of overweight and obesity suggests essentially a caloric-based dietary plan with an initial prescription of 1,200 to 1,500 kilocalories per day for women or 1,500 to 1,800 kilocalories per day for men for weight loss, which is essentially the 500 to 700 kilocalorie per day energy deficit. And the caloric restriction diet can be based on patient preference, food types, and health status. And there are a variety of dietary approaches that are available in the based on the patient preferences and goals, such as the DASH diet, which was designed for blood pressure improvement, the ketogenic diet, as I mentioned before. The paleo diet is very popular. It's the way people ate uh, thousands of years ago. And vegetarian uh, diets uh, have been around for a long time. What we do know is that most of the data, the most consistent, robust scientific data that we have supports the Mediterranean diet as the one that's most effective in reducing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. And often for my patients, I'll prescribe a Mediterranean diet but in the context of a caloric restriction such that they can both lose weight and improve their cardiovascular risk. And what do the prevention guidelines say? Well, the prevention guidelines give a class one recommendation to a diet that emphasizes vegetables, fruits, legumes, and nuts, whole grains, and fish. And that's essentially designed to reduce ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. What the, the guidelines do not recommend and say there's potential harm is a diet that has an intake of trans fats. So that should definitely be avoided in patients. Somewhat more in the gray zone are uh, you know, other macronutrient changes, such as replacing saturated fat with monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats, uh, a diet's reducing amounts of dietary cholesterol and sodium intake, and um, obviously you're trying to minimize things like processed meats and refined carbohydrates and sugar-sweetened beverages. Those are all good strategies to help lose weight, um, but the data 
for these in randomized clinical trials are, are, is not that robust. But nevertheless, it's part of a good strategy and a good guideline uh, for help with dietary patterns for patients. Let's move on in the last few minutes with novel non-pharmacological approaches to weight loss. So these generally take the form of two types, one, nutraceuticals, and two, devices. Most of these, I'll just um, emphasize, are investigational. Some are currently on the market and some are in development. But the idea is to think what's out there now in the future that we can actually hope for, things that go beyond just dietary modification, eating less and eating right, uh, and things that really can help modulate and modify one's metabolism and help someone uh, be satiated and eat less. Let's start with nutraceuticals. These, the concept is these are food supplements designed to promote weight loss. And they do this by varying mechanisms. There are several different examples, and I'll just go through a few. So some of them inhibit, delay, or modify nutrient absorption in the gut. One example of this is green tea, which is a popular nutraceutical, um, and many um, you know, health food uh, uh, um, interested folks will add green tea to their diet or whether it be through drinking green tea or adding in other, other ways. Appetite regulation is a key piece because that helps with the behavioral modification component as well. And whey protein is one uh, example of both a metabolic modulator as well as potentially regulating appetite. Some of them decrease or increase, excuse me, fat metabolism, such as diacylglycerol. And then there are potential nutraceuticals out there that increase energy expenditure, right? To uh, on the other side of the, of the energy equation, not just decreasing intake, but actually increasing output. And L-carnitine is one example of that. Let's just spend a few moments talking more about whey protein. So what it is is rich is this whey protein is rich in branched chain amino acids and bioactive peptides. And they stimulate the secretion of incretin peptides and insulin. As you know, incretins, particularly GLP-1, stimulate beta cell activity, augment the release of insulin, and regulate the rate of gastric emptying mediated through vagal afferents, uh, afferents such that gastric emptying is delayed and slow. Gut peptides, such as CCK and PYY, also have been reported stimulated by whey protein. They can also add to the delaying gastric emptying and regulating GI transit of food via centrally related mechanisms. And finally, bioactive peptides from whey protein may also inhibit DPP-4 activity, which again, increases activity of GLP-1. What this does altogether is helps improve the metabolism um, in, in, in much like mimicking a GLP-1 receptor agonist in trying to uh, help individuals lose weight. Now, there's, so there are some data for this. For, for example, this study that's presented this week at the ADA called the Zeus study, um, which was sponsored by Nestle, is a, uh, a study looking at a pilot study in 26 uh, individuals, about half females, mean age of 62 years with a BMI, a mean BMI of, 20, of 29, where they, the participants got a 10 gram pre-meal whey protein microgel uh, nutraceutical that was provided 15 minutes ahead of a pizza meal and it significantly augmented the GLP-1 response. As you can see here, the area under the curve increased by 66%, and the Cmax increased by 30%. In this context, it turns out that raising GLP-1 levels uh, has emerged, as obviously, as an important biomarker for cardiometabolic health. And these interventions, such as whey protein, which can act like GLP-1 receptor agonists and raise levels, have been reported to reduce glycemic variability and increase weight loss. Now, this, this clinical trial is really just a metabolic pilot trial, but certainly with, you know, with this understanding, things like whey protein microgels and other similar nutraceuticals um, will push forward through development, which may be a, a, you know, an inexpensive and low-risk way to induce GLP-1 uh, agonism in one's own metabolism to improve weight loss um, and reduce the risk for diabetes. Now let's move on to devices in the final few minutes that we have. There are several potential devices out there on the market. Some of them are mechanical in nature and some are non-mechanical. Now the mechanical ones um, are well known to, to many. And this is essentially a, a device that's ingested or placed surgically that induces weight loss through increased satiety to lower food intake or uh, alters absorption of food contents. 
Now, there are several of these that are placed endoscopically, um, and they include reshape, orbora, obolon, and aspire cysts. However, as you may um, have anticipated, endoscopic procedures require sedation, and with these type of devices, there are reported adverse events that can occur in the GI tract, such as bowel obstruction, ulceration, perforation, and hemorrhage. And so devices as such that are mechanical certainly have drawbacks that limits its widespread use among the patients who want to lose weight. Hence, the development of non-mechanical devices. And in general, these can be understood as expanding non-caloric ingestible devices that essentially produce satiety. And I'll talk about a couple here. So the first one I would like to mention is Gelesis 100 or Plenity. And this is a non-systemic oral hydrogel. And as you can see in the, in the figure, it's a prescription capsule that contains hydrogel particles that expand in the stomach after ingestion, but are not systemically absorbed. The way it works is the person takes the capsule and drinks lots of water. The water then expands the gels, and that creates a volume in the stomach to both, you know, you know to help with increased satiety and decrease food intake. Over you know, several minutes, that the, those hydrogels then transit through the GI tract, and as they do, they keep a person feeling full uh, longer, and then eventually they, they disintegrate and uh, they're excreted through the GI tract. And you know, there is some data for this uh, Plenity uh, nutraceutical, uh, sorry, this Plenity device, uh, showing some modest weight loss uh, compared you know, with, uh, with standard care. And as you can see here, in general, you know, we're looking at about um, 5% or so, uh, 3 to 5% weight loss with these type of devices. Now, although the, the weight loss is modest, uh, the, you know, the risk for these devices is are, are relatively low and, uh, and therefore may be more acceptable to individuals than, certain, than other pharmacologic therapies, which are much greater cost potentially and side effects. Um, and so this is just one example that uh, continues to be uh, to be uh, investigated. Another example is the epitome device, um, which is not currently approved, but it's a biodegradable encapsulated shape-shifting device um, that is made of absorbent polymers that self-expand in the stomach to create a peach-sensitive superabsorbent gel, gel structure. What they've showed uh, the developers is that there's a 40% reduction in the gastric emptying rate following 10 days of device treatment and what this creates is that it mimics a large solid food mass. And so it sends the tidy signals to the brain to decrease food intake. Importantly, the vice has no calories in itself, and it disintegrates into small particles within 30 minutes in the intestine, thereby minimizing the risk for gastric obstruction um, or other significant sequelae. In um, you know, one uh, example a study here, which was a single arm, single center pilot study over 12 uh, weeks, Patients took it twice daily. Uh, they were a baseline between a overweight and obese BMI, and the primary outcome here uh, was total body weight lost. Now, the, the patients here lost, you know, modest weight loss between three and four uh, percent on average with this device. But again, because it's you know, inert and relatively low risk, it might be uh, a very good choice for patients down the line who want to increase the satiety without necessarily uh, a pharmacologic means. And the uh, AEs here, the adverse events, were essentially GI, GI upset and headaches. So just to close in summary, the heterogeneity of BMI limits risk prediction and prognostication. Um, and although from a population st level standpoint, BMI is related to adverse cardiometabolic outcomes, in the in personalized medicine approaches, we really need to identify and go beyond BMI to identify those people at the highest risk who would benefit from therapies in order to decrease any adverse uh, events that might occur with these therapies. Now, the most important thing here is visceral and ectopic fat because adipose tissue distribution has nuanced information and visceral fat is likely the most important fat depot for ASCVD and heart failure risk. Ectopic fat depots also play a major role, including especially the liver fat and associate through shared risk factors and may contribute directly to, cardiov to cardiovascular disease such as seen with MAFLD. The modification of visceral ectopic fat is a key uh, component of future weight loss strategies because modifying these can actually decrease cardiometabolic risk. And we do know that traditional lifestyle interventions such as diet can be modified to change the type and or amount of food and can include adjunctive total or partial meal replacements 
and it may actually have really uh, great benefits for visceral ectopic fat. And so that's one area to be studied going further with both the uh, traditional uh, meal replacements uh, and also the novel uh, methods for visceral ectopic fat just to show which ones are most likely to be uh, beneficial for um, visceral ectopic fat. And finally, non uh, novel non-pharmacologic weight loss methods, such as nutraceuticals and devices, are currently being developed. The nutrients alter the metabolic response to a meal, such as whey protein, and the devices can cause satiety and modify food-related behaviors. So really produce a situation where patients can add their traditional lifestyle methods with these novel uh, non-pharmacologic methods to, to help uh, support them to lose weight and become live healthier lives going forward. And um, with that, We'll, we'll conclude this part of the talk. Thank you very much. This concludes tonight's program. And on behalf of Nestle Nutrition Institute, we would like to thank everyone for attending. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Before logging off, if you would please fill out an evaluation survey on the presentations, it would be much appreciated. Your feedback helps us to plan and improve future symposia. We hope to see you at another program soon. Thank you again and have a good night.